Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Augusta Sumilu, Business Relationship Manager here at Unicom Seminars. We are delighted to be hosting today's webinar titled 10 Things You Need to Know About Cucumber, Specflow, and BDD. The webinar is presented by Seb Rose, partner at Cucumber Limited. Seb has been involved in the full development life cycle and experience that ranges from architecture to support, from basic to Ruby. He's a partner in Cucumber Limited who help teams adopt and refine their agile practices with a particular focus on collaboration and automated testing. He's also a regular speaker at conferences, an occasional contributor to software journals, contributing author to 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. O'Reilly and lead author of the Cucumber for Java book, Pragmatic Developers. At this point, I would like to hand over to Seb. There will be opportunities for questions and answers at the end of uh, Seb's presentation. We hope you enjoyed the web webinar and welcome your feedback. Over to you, Seb. Thanks, Augustus. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, obviously, you can't speak to me, so you'll just, you'll just have to listen. It's a great situation for me to be in. Um, so this session is entitled 10 Things You Need to Know About BDD, Cucumber, and Specflow. Uh, it's more heavy about the BDD. Um, I will speak about Cucumber and Specflow, both of which are tools that you may have come across. They're both open source tools. Uh, but essentially, they have been created to support a behavior-driven development process, and that's what BDD stands for. Uh, I'm a partner at Cucumber Limited. Uh, Cucumber Limited was founded by Aslak Hausoy and Matt Wynn, uh, the creators of Cucumber. Um, and it includes myself, uh, Stephen Took, and Julian Biesman, who created Cucumber for JavaScript. So we've got a lot of um, BDD, Cucumber, and Specful experience in the, in the organization. Um, and if you have more questions after you finish this uh, presentation and that answered, aren't answered by the question and answer, um, I encourage you to uh, either email me at this address, seb at cucumber.io, or you can reach out on Twitter. So, to start with, let's have a bit of um, uh, history. BDD is an agile uh, approach, an agile method. It fits in with any other agile approach that you're, uh, method that you're using, for instance, Scrum or XP. Um, but there's, there's some things that we should, we should know about BDD. First off, it's, uh, it comes out of the work of Dan North, who's a consultant that works out of London. He used to be a ThoughtWorks um, employee, and while he was trying to train developers, he discovered, and this probably doesn't come as a surprise to a lot of you, that as soon as developers hear the word test, um, they kind of switch off. In the past, there's been uh, quite a big silo of separation between testers and developers, and developers tend to think that testers are the people that make sure their code works. Um, as opposed to quality engineers who try and um, ensure that the product that's delivered is fit for the customer. So um, he, he, he discovered that there were some issues uh, when, when testers doing TDD started using the word test. They kind of thought, well, why are we being taught to do TDD? Surely that's something that the testers uh, should be doing. Uh, Dan had been thinking about this for a while. Um, he was over at the Agile Development Conference in the US, and on the flight back, he was sitting next to a business analyst who also works in London, a guy called Chris Matz, and they had a discussion about the power of the word should, uh, which, um, which encourages people to question whether the system should actually behave in the way that's been specified. So rather than uh, writing documents and tests that say, this is what the behavior uh, it's supposed to be, and if it doesn't behave this way, it's a failure. They started thinking about how can we structure these conversations, this documentation, using the word should, so that it encourages people to actually question uh, their understanding and find any holes or assumptions that might have got missed. After a while, Dan decided uh, that he was going to actually do some work to try and support his, his beliefs, his insights, and he started working on a replacement for JUnit. Uh, this replacement was called JBehave. Uh, it started off as a very simple replacement for JUnit. Uh, back in the day, I don't know how many of you used uh, Java uh, back at, uh, at the turn of the century, uh, JUnit uh, identified tests because they, it had the word test in any method that was supposed to be a test. Um, 
And so what he did was he changed, uh, he, he basically did a re-implementation of jbehave look for the word should. Um, since then, jbehave has evolved a lot. Uh, it's probably not the, the leading um, BDD support tool in the, in the Java environment anymore, but it certainly uh, plowed its own furrow and um, pioneered the space. Dan has been asked a number of times, I mean, Dan, if you've never seen Dan North speak, I strongly recommend you do. He's, he's extremely articulate, very entertaining, um, and uh, is absolutely an unmissable speaker. Um, this particular couple of sentences was his attempt to try and define BDD or sell BDD to the business. Personally, I don't think these, were, uh, these represent Dan's finest hour in communicating. It's... It's quite a dense definition. It's got a lot of commas, a lot of uh, a lot of buzzy type words in it. We're going to revisit this statement later, um, but uh, I think for now, uh, take a look at it. Decide that maybe this doesn't really explain explain BDD as much as you would like it to, and uh, we'll move on. So the first concept that I really want to um, I want to I don't know, myth I, I would like to bust, area that I'd like to explore is the fact that there are a number of different acronyms uh, kicking around on the internet that sort of fit into the same space. So BDD is clearly uh, the acronym that I use in the title of this presentation, Behavior Driven Development. Uh, there's also, we've also seen the TDD acronym, which is Test Driven Development. Um, this slide shows one called SBE, which stands for Specification by Example. And you may also be familiar with ATDD, which is Acceptance Test Driven Development. And the question is, uh, or question is often asked, um, what's the difference between them all? Uh, this is a picture of uh, one of my colleagues, also based in London, called Liz Keo, who worked closely with Dan in the development of JBehave. Uh, and she answered this question in a blog post uh, called A Potted History of Some Related Stuff About BDD. And her answer is very concise. They're called different things. Essentially, all of these acronyms talk about processes where you think about how the system is supposed to behave before you do anything. You document how it's supposed to behave with either a test or an example or a scenario. Uh, and then once you see the, once you've expressed the way that you would behave and you have captured that as a failing test, you then go and write the code that satisfies uh, that requirement that implements that behavior. So we can absolutely, I hope we can all agree that ATDD, BDD, and uh, SBE are all completely identical things because they are, um, they are approaches that include the, the business uh, stakeholders, the customer, uh, along with testers and developers in documenting how the system should behave. TDD is very similar. It's the slight difference is that TDD typically doesn't try uh, and include non-technical stakeholders in the discussion. So they're all the same approach. We start from the outside, we define how the system is supposed to behave, and from there we, we, we derive the implementation. An essential part to any BDD process is collaboration. So uh, we continually get um, requests from QA managers for us to train their test team in BDD. And although that's, it's, it's, it's wonderful that people are asking for that, you cannot, you cannot do BDD in isolation. It's not a, an activity for a single role. The whole uh, purpose behind uh, what BDD has become is to break down uh, communication barriers between business uh, customers and stakeholders and the technical team. So we need to work together. This picture is from the movie The Three Amigos, and the meeting at the center of the, the BDD process has come to be called the Three Amigos meeting, because we believe uh, you need to have representatives from the business community, the development community, and the test community at that meeting, talking to each other at the same time. Um, Aslak Helsoy, who I mentioned was uh, the creator of Cucumber and also a partner in Cucumber Limited, um, wrote this article a couple of years ago now to try and um, re-emphasize that Cucumber is a tool that supports collaboration. Collaboration is the essence of all agile development. It communicates 
it's how we it's, it's how we get people to do things uh, that meet the goals of our stakeholders. And this is a diagram uh, that sort of tries to give a, a high level view of the, um, the this Three Amigos workshop. The idea of the workshop is that the business owner or product owner comes to the meeting with some candidate user stories, potentially just one candidate user story, the next most important thing to be done. And at the meeting, the developers uh, and the testers challenge their understanding of the scope of that, that story using concrete examples. And when we say concrete examples, we really do mean thinking about how the system will behave given actual context and actual input data. Now, once you, when you start challenging your understanding like that, you quite frequently get find, uh, you unearth hidden assumptions. You find areas that weren't fully understood. And you get ideas about how to split this user story into small user stories. And quite often, you get ideas about other user stories that really need to be thought about it later. Um, and so they feed back into the product backlog. The output of this uh, workshop is concrete examples. And concrete examples make excellent test cases because you've already thought about the, the context that the system is in when this example takes place. You've thought about the concrete data that's going to be passing through, and you've articulated what your expected outcome is. So those test cases can then be the basis of automated tests. And the automated tests in a TDD or BDD way will then help the developers drive out the code that will implement the system that the customer wants. This Three Amigos meeting uh, will fit into a standard Scrum style development process. Um, some organizations use it, uh, use it to replace uh, sprint planning. Uh, other organizations, uh, and for me, if you've got uh, the availability of product owner or business analysts on a regular basis, this, this, uh, this other model that I'm about to describe works better. Um, schedule this very short um, Three Amigos sessions on a regular regular basis, that's either daily or every other day, which means that during the sprint you can start working on the stories that are going to be candidates for the sprint backlog for the next sprint. The wonderful thing about a short meeting is that it's a short meeting. Um, I would ask you to put your hands up if you like long meetings, but I wouldn't be able to see your answers. The third thing that I think is important to stress is that Although uh, I'm a developer of Cucumber, I work with Specflow, I have a great affection for both of those tools, BDD does not need these tools. The, the, first, uh, the first rule of BDD is collaboration. So again, let's go back to uh, Liz Keto, um, who said that having conversations is more important than capturing conversations, which is more important than automating conversations. And this is really at the heart of the process, and it, if you recall the Agile Manifesto, it's also one of the um, one of the key principles of the the Agile Manifesto, which is people and interactions over processes and tools. Um, there are also heuristics about how many conversations you need to have. What's what's the actual uh, um, extent to which you need to to communicate and collaborate? And the truth is that there's a, there's there's a diminishing return, but Especially when you start doing this sort of form of collaboration, you don't want to scrimp on the time that you spend actually working out how we communicate with each other. So, having said that tools aren't important, let's talk about tools. Uh, Cucumber is simple. Um, I'm going to give you a like, two-minute overview of Cucumber, and what I say here also applies to Specful, which is known um, as uh, Cucumber for .NET. So the core concepts are that uh, the concrete examples that we discover and articulate in the Three Amigos session uh, get transcribed into feature files. Feature files are plain text files. Um, within a feature file, uh, there are a number of scenarios. One scenario corresponds to one concrete example. The scenarios uh, are made up of separate line items, which are known as steps, and they follow a syntax, which is called Gherkin. Uh, there is glue code. So this is the code that will join your feature files up to the application that you're building. Uh, the glue code contains step definitions. So, as you might be able to guess, the steps from the feature file files are uh, connect directly to the step definitions in the glue code and cause 
automated activities to take place um, within your application. Uh, the glue code, uh, if you're using Qcom for Java, that would be the glue, the glue code step definitions would be written in Java or one of the other JVM languages. If you're working in .NET or using Specflow, the step definitions will be written in C Sharp. There are many, many other versions of Cucumber available, uh, and in all cases, the step definitions will be written in the language of that implementation of Cucumber. So, the Cucumber or Specflow will uh, parse and read the feature files. It will um, cause scenarios to be run, and when the scenario is run, it will pick out a step from the scenario, find the matching step definition, and call the code that's associated with that step definition which then causes your application to be called. And so this is where um, the BDD process of co collaboration and communication and concrete examples um, feeds into the test automation of test cases. And as I said, each scenario is an example. So here is um, a, an example of a feature file. It's about um, scoring in a game, and there are a couple of scenarios sitting in there. Uh, when Cucumber runs, it picks out a few, uh, it picks out the first scenario, it runs the step definitions, and in almost every environment where Cucumber Specflow runs, if they pass, uh, they get colored green. Um, and if they fail, they get colored red. At that point, you know that your specification is somewhat at odds from your implementation. And that could be because there's a defect in your code, it could be because you haven't implemented that feature yet, or it could be that since you wrote that specification in the first place, the specification has become outdated because the implementation has changed. Uh, Ruby, uh, which was the original Cucumber implementation, has a very concise way of writing step definition. Uh, Java is somewhat more verbose. Uh, C Sharp is also a little bit verbose. But essentially, they all come to the same thing, which is that there is a, a regular expression. In this particular case, it's within the double quotes, I register a team. And Cucumber matches up the, regular, the text within the step in the feature file with the regular expression in the step definition file. Cucumber and Specflow come from uh, the same background. They both use Gherkin in exactly the same way, but they have slight differences, and I'm going to skip over these very quickly uh, because you know they're not they're not very significant and they aren't critical. Uh, the first is that um, in, in Gherkin, all steps are introduced with a keyword. There are five keywords. Uh, the five keywords are given, when, then, and, and but. Uh, within Cucumber, all step definitions live in a global namespace. Within Specflow, uh, given, when, and then within distinct namespaces. This is a bit theoretical at this point in the discussion, but it's worth, worth bearing in mind if you happen to be in a team that's working in both Java and .NET. There comes a time when your glue code uh, becomes large. You will have a large domain, you'll have lots of features, you'll have lots of scenarios, and at that point, you will have more than one step definition file. You will have more than one uh, class that your glue code lives in. Uh, and then you'll need to share stuff between your step definitions. Uh, Cucumber in Ruby and has a different way of sharing that state uh, from the way it's done in the Java world. Um, and Specflow has um, other ways of doing it as well. So again, this is done at the very low level implementation detail that is only going to be of interest to developers but it is a significant difference and something that people need to be aware of. Finally, there's a, there's, a, there's a feature within Cucumber called hooks, and this is essentially like a step definition that gets called at a particular point in the life cycle of a scenario. The reason hooks exist is because there are things that you might have to do to enable automation that are very much technical facing, and they would make no sense to your business people. And so you don't want to pollute your feature file with, I don't know, starting a database or a web server or dropping a, um, an Oracle table or, or some of these um, uh, setup uh, activities that uh, are required for the context to be correct but are not significant from a business perspective. And hooks is where you do this. Again, the Cucumber, uh, the Cucumber world has uh, some, uh, a set of hooks specifically uh, before and after 
whereas Specful has gone pretty much to town and you can run hooks at many places in the scenario lifecycle. One of the huge benefits of um, Cucumber and Specflow as a way of com communicating and collaborating between uh, business stakeholders and technical uh, participants is that the documentation that the feature files represent is what we call living documentation. And I've sort of touched, uh, touched on this already because the, the world is full of documentation that is out of date and how do you really ever make sure that the documentation of how your system behaves is up to date. Answers range from peer review to work items on your back, um, but essentially they're all, they all come down to relying on a human process to make sure that any change in the code has been reflected in the documentation or vice versa. The feature files, however, that the Cucumber and Specflow consume are in fact automated tests and they run against your, the current implementation of your software. So when they fail, that shows you that, as I said, either the software has a defect in it or your documentation is out of date. And you get that signal straight away. The feedback loop is very, very short, which means that you are forced by a failing build to go and fix your documentation. This is a huge benefit. The, the, again, I'm showing the, uh, a slide which has got the feature file, that, uh, slightly more of the feature file that we showed uh, earlier in the presentation. And down the right-hand side, uh, I'm showing the three artifacts that you would expect to come out of an agile process that is working with BDD. So the user stories are your typical start point for uh, an agile, um, certainly for a scrum process and an XP process. Uh, and for every user story, you will have one or more acceptance criteria which uh, define the scope of that user story. So it's when those acceptance criteria have been satisfied, that's when you know that that user story has been delivered. Uh, well, from the Three Amigos meeting, we will have one or more ex concrete examples uh, that illustrate each of those acceptance criteria. So we've got all these artifacts that come out of the Three Amigos session. Um, what happens to them? How do we record them? What use are they uh, for posterity? So first off, each example uh, gets um, transcribed as a scenario within a feature file. And so we can lose uh, the examples once, once we've coded them up in the feature file because they've been recorded there and the feature file will be checked into source control along with the code. The acceptance criteria uh, get transcribed into the, the preamble of the feature file. And so now when someone comes to the feature file, they can read the preamble and they can see uh, which uh, acceptance criteria have been described and illustrated and satisfied by the scenarios in this feature file. So the acceptance criteria themselves are recorded and in source control, so we no longer have to keep a hold of that output that came from uh, the Three Amigos meeting. And then finally we have the user story. Uh, there's no user story in the feature file. That's because the user story is a, a vehicle for planning uh, work. It's a vehicle for trying to slice things into small increments of value. It delivers value to the customer, but a user story that's perfectly suitable for implementation today, it may well be superseded by a more high fidelity user story tomorrow. So my suggestion is that user stories, once they have been implemented, do not document the requirements, they don't document anything useful, and uh, we should be quite happy to dispose of them. Uh, you may have thought that what I'm saying is that feature files will become your only documentation. I'm not saying that at all. There will be other forms of documentation necessary from uh, system architecture diagrams all the way through to support uh, and uh, user um, instruction manuals. So there, there's other documentation necessary, but the feature file does replace a large amount of technical um, documentation, documentation that is usually used for capturing requirements and passing information backwards and forwards between the different stakeholders or uh, teams within a uh, development organization. BDD uh, is a way of specifying early in the process uh, how a system should behave and turning them into automated tests. That doesn't mean that you can get rid of your QA department uh, and uh, this is something that is, it, it may seem ridiculous but I have to say this because I have met managers who think that BDD will mean that they can fire all of their testers. There's a lot more to um, ensuring the quality of your 
software uh, than just um, automated feature file uh, scenarios. So this is a, a, a my version of the well-known test automation pyramid. Um, and what we're really showing here is that you still need exploratory and manual testing, even if you've got a well-defined pyramid of um, automated tests. Uh, and this is the Agile Testing Quadrant from um, Agile Testing Group by uh, Lisa Crisp and Janet Gregory. And again, there's much more to uh, the Agile Testing role than just testing uh, the behavior of some scenarios, as you can see from this, um, uh, from this quadrant. Uh, not only is BDD, does BDD not mean that you can fire all the testers, it doesn't mean that TDD, BDD is just for testers. So there are other teams where uh, they think that the, the testers are going to take over the role of writing uh, the feature files in Gherkin, uh, implementing them, and essentially it's just another test activity. Remember, it's a collaboration activity. So one reason for this is recall the, this diagram that I showed earlier on uh, where the step definitions call the application. Well, the step definitions are written in code. It needs to be structured like code. Um, quite often, you might even find that you will need to write some test support code to make the step definitions easy to read and to make them more maintainable. And all of this is development activity. It requires people to write code who have a knowledge of how to write software well. And that means they need development skills. And not all test testers will have those development skills. Uh, and even when they be you begin to have departments that have testers uh, which ha that also have development skills, such as the, the new the newish role of developer in test, you still find that it's not it's not it's not a good way of working to have the testers entirely responsible for the feature files. And the reason for that is that the feature files should be written in a ubiquitous language. Now, this is a term that comes from domain-driven design uh, from Eric Evans, and the idea here is that we are going to be writing our scenarios in language that can be shared and unambiguously understood by everyone involved in the project and that that language should be rooted in the business domain. And if you leave the responsibility of writing those feature files to testers, it's going to not be rooted in the business domain. It certainly won't have been reviewed by the business. When you write your scenarios, we want to have the right amount of detail in them. It's important that they validate that the system behaves in the way that the customer expects, but they also need to document how the system works. They need to be easy to read so that the business people can give you feedback on them and that you can understand how the system works by reading them. We suggest that you try and keep them focused uh, using declarative ubiquitous language rather than um, dropping into an imperative way of structuring your set scenarios. And when I think of imperative, I quite often use this style of uh, scenario as an example. Here, this is not talking about the value that the customer is expecting in the software. It's talking about the orders that the user is giving through the web interface or the UI. Um, this is an imperative way of writing an interface it's very brittle, it's very verbose, it's full of incidental details. A much more declarative way of expressing this exactly the same uh, scenario is this. Because what the customer is trying to do, the context for this scenario is that they're trying to sign up for a new account. Um, the action is that they should be seeing uh, a greeting message on their feed page. This is, what this is the outcome that they're expecting. Uh, more detail on this was uh, given by Dan North in a great blog post from quite a few years ago now. Uh, I encourage you to read that. Um, so this has been a whirlwind tour. Uh, I've been talking for almost half an hour now. Uh, and I've covered a lot of things in a very, very thin level of detail. There are a number of books out there that you can buy uh, or access anyway to try and learn more. There are obviously courses, uh, training and coaching that you can that you can uh, make yourself make use of yourselves. But when it comes down to any new skill, I'm sure you're aware that until you start practicing, uh, you don't get any better. It doesn't actually um, go into the muscle memory. You don't internalize it and get com comfortable with it. So I'd like to introduce you to a, a free website called cyberdojo.org. 
which is a place to practice programming. Um, Cyber Dojo was originally created by John Jagger for um, teams to practice test-driven development. So if you have any development teams, I really suggest you have a, get them to have a look at this because it has a number of wonderful features for working together to get better at our jobs. However, within the context of this particular presentation, it has two things that I think are of great value. One is that SpecFlow has been integrated um, with uh, CyberDojo when you're working in C-sharp, which means that you can practice using the SpecFlow development environments uh, and practice writing feature files and glue code, getting better at it on small problems that don't uh, impact your day job. And equally, Java has, been, uh, has had Cucumber integrated with it. So you'll notice if you look on the right hand side, there's a second one under Cucumber which says Cucumber Spring. So you may recall that I mentioned sharing state data um, earlier on when I was talking about uh, Cucumber and Spectral being slightly different. Well, Cucumber um, ships with a number of different ways of sharing state between step definition files. Uh, one of them is a very lightweight dependency injection container called Pico Container. Uh, and another one is a much more common and quite a lot heavier weight uh, framework called Spring. And so you can practice both of these uh, within the CyberDojo uh, environment. So uh, you may have noticed that I started at zero and went through to 10. So that wasn't exactly decimal 10 uh, things to know about BDD, Speckle, and Cucumber. And now I'm going to dive, uh, revert to binary. So another 10 things that you should know about Cucumber. The first is that BDD demands collaboration. So co collaboration is not optional. You can use Cucumber and SpecFlow as much as you like, but if you're not collaborating between business developments and uh, testers, uh, you are not doing BDD. You are using a collaboration tool that supports BDD uh, to do test automation. And I would suggest that that's an inappropriate use of that tool. And my experience, shows me that organizations that try to use it in that way uh, generally don't succeed. And second, or tenth, uh, is that examples are the technique, the mechanism through which uh, the BDD process um, derives its oxygen. They facilitate feedback, they allow testers and developers to challenge their understanding and the assumptions of the business. So, that was my 30 minutes on BDD, Speckful, and Cucumber. Um, uh, you, those are my contact details, which I believe will remain on screen uh, for a while. And I'm now going to, I'm happy to answer questions. I, I have one question uh, on my screen at the moment, which I'll read out in just a second. But I believe you've got a section on your, um, on your screen to ask questions as well. So please feel free, and I will answer as many as I can before I run out of time. So, the question I have is, how do you compensate for missed examples? Uh, and the answer is, the, is, is exactly the same it be as how do you compensate for missed requirements. Uh, you find out later on in the process when your customer tells you that you've missed something and you have to go back and rework, do a late night bug fix or another release. So the whole they have the whole idea of putting the business, the test, and the developer in a room talking at the same time, generating the examples, is that you get three different perspectives talking face to face. And our experience is that that uncovers many of the unknown unknowns, many of the um, hidden assumptions, many of the areas that haven't yet been thought about. Because those three different uh, roles have such different perspectives. So, so, uh, so to restate, uh, you don't compensate for it. I'm afraid you, what, what we're doing here is trying to minimize the way that examples or requirements or hidden assumptions can be missed, but there's always a possibility for missing, uh, missing an example, losing a requirement. Next question was, how do you organize your feature files? One feature file per acceptance criteria, or rather one per functional area? Well, the, the, the answer is kind of it depends, but essentially feature files, uh, I guess the name says what we're intending you to do with them, is think about a feature of the application from the, the user's point of view. Now one of, the, one of the useful things about them being plain text files obviously is that anyone can read them 
uh, business folk can read them just as easily as developers. The other thing is that they live on the file system in folders. Uh, and the way we recommend is that we, you organize those folders in a structured way, uh, like a tree. And at the top level, you split, uh, you create a folder of each functional area, and you have feature files that deal with um, high-level journeys, um, overviews of how the system works. And then in subfolders, you drill down into deeper technicalities or um, more variations and exception conditions about how that feature behaves when, how it should behave when it's been implemented. Uh, and the analogy that I use is one with a, with a technical document. When you think of a technical document, you look in the table of contents and you see sections 1 through 10, for instance. But under section 1, you'll have section 1.1, and under that, you might have 1.1.1, etc., etc. So I try and organize my feature files in exactly the same way that I would organize a requirements document or a, or a technical document that describes how the system behaves. We're thinking about what the, what the user is trying to get out of it. We start with high-level um, high concepts, and then if we feel that it will give value to the business or the customer, we drill down into lower level, more detailed, more focused examples that then you know, give, you, give you insight into, let's say, how the system handles daylight saving time. So the next question is, how much detail do you put in a scenario? So I'm going to, I'm going to refer you back to um, the slide, I think it was item nine, about how much detail. And the idea is that a scenario should explore a single behavior. Uh, so a scenario is made up of given when then um, steps. The given step or steps will set up the context of the system. So it's stuff that's happened essentially in the past. The when uh, step will talk about the action that the user or the agent will uh, will enter into with the system. And then the then step of steps will validate the outcome. What we're looking for here is scenarios that are short. We recommend that a scenario should be no more than five steps. Uh, so we're looking for detail, but we're looking for just the essential detail that is important to understand for the particular behavior that the scenario is illustrating or validating. So the question is, I guess the acid test is always, always, are my business people reading my scenarios on a regular basis? Are they giving me meaningful feedback on my scenarios? Because if you get too much detail, nobody really knows what's important in a scenario. If you get too little detail, nobody gets any value from it. So partly the answer is who is your audience, and partly uh, the answer is how complex are the behaviors uh, that you're trying to describe. My experience is that if you end up with lots of given steps, which is quite often what happens, there's an awful lot of different bits of data that need to be set up for a scenario to, to make sense. Actually, Actually, what we're looking for is to try and find a way of articulating that in a declarative way. In the same way that in the example I moved from a lot of, uh, if you remember from the comparing of two scenarios when we were talking about imper imperative and declarative scenarios, uh, the first scenario had a lot of detail about what gets typed in and which edit boxes, what links are pressed, what buttons are clicked. And then the declarative example said, when I sign up for an account. And that's how you move from um, from very, from lots of incidental detail that really doesn't help understand the behavior that we're trying to describe, down to declarative, um, uh, declarative expression of the behavior with only enough information uh, that's essential to know. And then the next question is, is this more powerful than the standard methods of testing? So this is, uh, this is I'm, not, I'm not sure I want to answer that question in exactly the way that it's been phrased. It's a different beast. This is not about testing. This is about, or maybe it's about testing, but it's a shifted left version of testing. So we're not testing. We are actually having this conversation in the Three Amigos session before any code is written. So we're uh, de-ambiguating. We are making sure that the 
business have articulated the customer's requirements in a way that has been definitively understood by the development and the test team. We're not waiting till the developer picks it off the backlog for him to find out he hasn't got enough detail. We're not waiting until the tester gets given some code before she finds out that it, her understanding of what the system was supposed to do is different from the developer's understanding of what the system should do. So from that perspective, yes, it's more powerful because it's happening earlier in the process. It's happening before we've done any work that could potentially be down a blind alley. We're, we're uh, making the process cheaper. There are still uh, huge benefits, as I showed in the um, Agile testing quadrants, that uh, the skilled uh, and experienced tester can bring to quality assurance. So they're complementary. What's the best way to introduce BDD to a small company, three amigo session? What activities would you absolutely suggest? So I'm going to answer this one quickly because I'm running out of time. I suggest you go to the cucumber.io website and go to our blog and search for an article by my colleague Matt Wynn called Introducing Example Mapping. And that gives you a lot of hints there. Equally reach out to, out to me and I can speak to you about it uh, offline. Next question is, I am using Cucumber for browser automation. In UI forms we need to fill data, so my question is, is it a good approach to fill all form details in step definitions? So my answer here would be consider the page object pattern uh, and your step definitions typically will not talk about fields. They will probably defer to support code and the support code will be implemented in terms of the page object pattern and that will be used to fill in the fields on the form. Uh, question of how do you handle dependency between scenarios? I'm glad someone asked this question. There should be no dependency between scenarios. Cucumber and Specflow both go to a lot of effort to ensure that there is no leakage of state between scenarios. Scenarios should be implemented, or should be executable in any order. If you have any dependency between scenarios, you are misusing Cucumber and Specflow um, and you will get yourself into trouble. Please don't do that. Uh, I'm afraid I don't understand the next question, which was many small over some larger files. Um, if it's what I think it means, uh, you have to organize it so it makes sense to you, your business stakeholders, and your development team. Another question, do you capture non-functional requirements in the same way? That's a great question, and the answer is typically no. Um, if the non-functional requirements are extremely hard, uh, to verify in an automated way, uh, and so typically that will be part of the space that I would have, that I would, that my slide that says there are other forms of documentation. Uh, another question was how are scenarios captured in the Three Amigos meeting paper? Um, I'm going to refer you again to uh, Matt's uh, article on introducing example mapping. We typically prefer to use handwritten record cards uh, and then uh, post after the meeting, developers and testers work together to uh, take the exam concrete examples and turn them into Gherkin, write them into feature files, and then pass them back to uh, product owners for review. Another question, do you recommend taking a TDD approach for the automated framework you will write for your glue code? Uh, interesting. No, we don't. Uh, what we typically find is, I mean, I guess it depends on the complexity of your automated framework. So if it's a big beast and you've got a lot of different um, moving parts, then TDD may well be appropriate. But essentially, mostly the customers that I'm working with did not building a huge framework. Uh, and so what happens is that the, uh, that the scenario drives the step definition, the step definition drives the implementation. You see it fail at each point, and then you see it pass. And it's that movement from red to green that gives you the confidence that what you've implemented uh, actually is testing what you're expecting and is delivering the implementation that you are, your customers wanting. And then the final question that I'm going to answer is one, how readily is it being adopted in the marketplace? Uh, so the trouble with... Uh, trying to answer a question like this is that I could appeal to Gartner or some of these surveys um, and 
it's it's difficult to know. So how how well is Agile being adopted in the marketplace? If you looked if you looked at the stats, Agile is is almost mainstream. But if you go and visit companies, you'll find that most most places or many places are implementing Scrum Butt or Water Scrum Fall or have just appropriated Agile terminology but haven't really changed the way they're working. From a BDD perspective, the book by Goiko Adzik called Specification by Example uh, talks about his journey over the past years with companies across the world that have implemented BDD and he's showing a, li a, a large number of successful uptakes. It's not quantitative, it's a qualitative analysis. From our perspective, we're seeing the upload, the downloads of various Cucumber uh, tools uh, ramping on quite a steep growth curve. We think that later this year we'll hit 6 million downloads of Cucumber. So that would tend to imply that it, there, there is um, an uptick in the adoption of certainly using Cucumber. It's difficult though to correlate that back necessarily to the adoption of BDD. So I'm afraid I'm not going to give you a definitive answer there, but um, but it's definitely becoming more commonplace to hear people talking about BDD, and it's certainly being more commonplace to see people downloading uh, the tools that support the automation part of the BDD process. And at that point, I'm going to say thank you very much for coming along, and pass you back to Augustus. That concludes the question and answer session. We would like to thank you, Seb, for a very brilliant and highly insightful presentation. I trust everyone enjoyed that. There was loads of questions. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. We hope you found your participation of use. We will make the recording available afterwards and send you the link. We look forward to your future participation at another Unicom event. Thank you. Bye now.